Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Startup Confessionals, where we interview startup founders and entrepreneurs in the Middle East and Africa. We'll learn about some of the biggest lessons these founders discovered on their journey from the personal to the professional and share how they keep themselves motivated. Today's episode is with Karim Khashaba, the co-founder and CEO of Yodawi, founded in October 2018. Yodawi is a digital healthcare infrastructure that upgrades the medication value chain and improves access to medication at the lowest cost. Kareem's also an ex-engineer and booze and company consultant. He's had 10 plus years of management consulting and technology experience across Europe and the Middle East. And in 2016, Kareem also founded MedX Cloud, a clinic and hospital management platform currently serving 100 plus public and private sector clients across Egypt. So welcome to the show, Kareem. Yes, Neem. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. So Kareem, uh, before we kind of get into your journey, I'd love for you to share a value proposition of Yodawi with our audience. Sure. Um, Yodawi is basically the uh, emerging markets version of the pharmacy benefits platform model that had emerged in the US in the early 2000s. In, in, in simple words, it's a um, digital platform that connects insurance companies, pharmacies, uh, consumers, and pharma distributors to streamline the medication value chain and make sure the consumer gets the medication in the simplest and, and cheapest way possible. And so why did you decide to tackle this particular industry? I know that before we started the conversation, um, we spoke about how different the Middle East region is versus other regions when it comes to medication and uh, pharmacy. So I'm wondering if you can also share that perspective, like how is it different and how does it, how does it work really? Sure. Um, I think when, when, Talking about healthcare markets uh, and specifically healthcare markets in emerging markets where um, digitization in general of medical records is uh, it's st- it's still quite minimal or almost non existent, uh, where the digital links between medical providers and insurance companies have not yet been uh, properly developed. Uh, where uh, a lot of the prescriptions are still paper-based and most of the insurance claims processing is, is, is manual. It's, um, it's a very different world compared to uh, the kind of your, your typical standard best practice uh, Western economy at this stage. Um, and the challenges are different. The way you would uh, design solutions uh, is, is very, very different. Um, I had my first experience with the with the Egyptian healthcare market in, in 2016 when I started Medex Cloud. At the time, we, we kind of wanted to uh, start digitizing medical records, basically, and giving hospitals and clinics uh, a way to manage their finances, record patient uh, uh, interactions, and kind of take, uh, to a large extent, kind of a, a normal steps towards digitizing the, the the patient encountered at the provider side. Um, while this was um, quite successful with the public sector uh, clients that had top-down enforcement, uh, it became clear to us that uh, starting at the medical provider side would be very, very difficult in an emerging market, especially that there's no incentive for medical providers to uh, kind of encounter on the digitization journey. Uh, and it's also worth noting that even in the U.S., it was, this kind of uh, transition was not easy and had to be uh, incentivized substantially uh, by, by, the, by the government. So uh, in an emerging market that is a lot more fragmented, that is a lot less regulated, um, where there is substantial cost pressure on medical providers, this, let's say, uh, uh, sufficient or, or required pressure or incentive is not there to really embark on this journey. And the problem is that if the medical providers don't digitize uh, uh, patient encounters, pretty much the rest of the ecosystem has to continue processing everything. Wow. Because I think, um, Kareem, that processing things manually is also kind of difficult um, to manage, especially in an ecosystem that feels 
so fragmented, right? Like the information is not going to get to people in real time with that model. And so it's just sort of, yeah, just as surprising and shocking that it's has taken as long as it has, right, to to digitize this. And um, but but Kareem, I'm also curious uh, how the kind of health laws work in the Middle East um, because we we've got things like HIPAA. Um, so I'm I'm just curious, like, do you guys have any kind of regulatory arm that oversees the um, digitization of health data? Um, I think the, the the most direct answer would be no. <laughs> Regulators are still uh, focused on kind of the traditional uh, healthcare model. Uh, just kind of governing uh, quality and managing certifications of staff and so on. I think at this stage, there is no kind of uh, conscious effort to create a regulatory framework for digitization of medical records. What is happening actually is that the standards that are being developed in the U.S. are uh, basically spilling over into the Middle East. So um, a lot of companies now are considering using uh, HL7 or the FHIR standard for data exchange. People are starting to talk about HIPAA compliance, even though there's no regulatory framework. Um, so, so a lot of kind of the, 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 the IP and the intelligence that is being developed in the US ends up uh, spilling over to uh, emerging markets one way or another, with obviously the need to localize a lot of what is there, because not everything is, is directly applicable uh, to, to an emerging market and, and Egypt specifically. Got it. Got it. Wow. What do you say is your like competitive advantage here? Like, how are you guys different than other things in market? Are you the only you know company that's in this space, or I, I believe that there's probably others at this point, correct? I think people have approached uh, the the kind of digitization of uh, the medication supply chain or consumer ordering. Uh, so, so yes, there are a few companies that offer kind of digital medication ordering. I think at this stage, we are the only uh, platform that actually connects uh, insurance companies and payers to the medication ordering uh, process. Uh, And so that kind of makes us uh, quite unique. We've actually gone as far as helping insurance companies and payers of different kinds to develop uh, their own uh, approval or, or, or claims management capabilities by digitizing a lot of the decision-making that the insurance company would otherwise do manually. Uh, And obviously kind of being able to offer a decision in in real time. So uh, in a way, this this has been kind of the source of defensibility for us from day one, kind of our our more holistic approach towards the the, the platform. And we have uh, been successful at getting 90% of the payers in Egypt onto the platform. Wow, that's amazing. And how did the pandemic affect your business? Because you guys started really uh, kind of like right before, a year or so before the pandemic. Uh, I think the, the, the pandemic, especially in during 2020, um, has had a significant awareness impact on the kind of average Egyptian. Uh, more and more people are willing to uh, order everything online, which did not used to be the case before. Um, so that has been kind of very positive. We saw uh, a substantial surge uh, in uh, in orders uh, during the, the, the kind of the COVID or peak, I would call it. I think by the end of 2020, uh, you could say uh, things had begun to normalize across the country in general. And even throughout 2021, the impact of COVID had been uh, reduced significantly, at least in Egypt. So this may not be the case in other countries, but certainly the case in Egypt. Um, and so what about um, expanding to other markets? Uh, you guys are just based in, you started out in Egypt. Uh, can you talk to us about your expansion efforts? Sure. So um, uh, we, we are at the moment uh, kind of looking at uh, expansion in, in Africa and the Middle East and even uh, some uh, Eastern European countries that we find very, very interesting. Uh, Of course, we're still very, very busy in Egypt. The company has been around for uh, less than three years in total. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. 
Um, we feel obviously the Middle East, in the Middle East, we have kind of a home court uh, advantage. Uh, but we're also very, very excited about what's happening in Africa in general and the opportunities that are being presented. Wow, amazing. And what about in terms of your growth? Because I think a lot of people who are starting out companies have very different objectives, very different uh, goals, right, as as you grow and as you scale. So what has happened in your world when it comes to the priorities, the things that you're paying attention to as you've uh, grown from October 2018 um, when you started the company up until now? Um, I think, uh, let's say, uh, the company in its initial phase is very typically, or at least the team, uh, wouldn't call it the company at the beginning, the team is typically very focused on kind of getting a proof of concept. And so really it's predominantly around the digital product, uh, maybe in, in the kind of first phase of the company, making sure that the app uh, that we created for the consumers is usable, is easy to, to access, uh, there is no barrier in the experience and so on. As the company starts to grow, um, there is much bigger focus on overall operations of the company. All the back office operations start to take more importance. Uh, the, the, the manpower starts to scale and so on. Um, and as the company continues, starts to grow significantly going into kind of the, the two, three hundred employees, it becomes much more around, uh, uh, for me, probably, um, making sure that there's a bigger kind of institutional framework across the company, making sure there's the right, right leadership in place, right uh, management talent in place, to make sure kind of the process infrastructure of the company overall is, uh, is, 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 is working. The strategy is uh, consistent. Um, whatever we're trying to do uh, is, uh, is uh, being measured. We're, we're kind of, we're, we're actually quite obsessed about analytics in uh, Tudewi. So the, the, the priorities shift, the kind of the, the problems typically shift as well or, or change. Um, yeah, and it's usually very, very important to adapt to spot the signs early, to make sure we're always six months ahead of the problem. So uh, this is kind of the, 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 the typical uh, path, I would say. Wow, awesome. And how do you, you said that you're very analytics driven. Um, like what sort of metrics are you paying attention to? And, and also like, how do you balance between the metrics that you're paying attention to and also the feedback that you're getting from your customers? Like, how often do you, have you built out some sort of strategy or process uh, to get feedback from your customers or, yeah. So I'm just curious about those two questions. Sure. So um, we typically track pretty much everything that happens to the order to make sure um, it was kind of overall uh, a perfect experience. Let's put it this way. Um, we also track everything that happened to uh, prescriptions and the approval from the insurance company. We analyze what type of prescriptions would take a slightly longer time to approve in case they were not kind of automatically approved in real time. We try to correlate this across uh, different diseases to understand if the insurance company has a weakness in a specific area that we need to direct them to. We track cost utilizations for insurance companies to help them kind of manage their costs in, in, in general. This is kind of on the back office side. Um, of course, we uh, uh, we track overall customer satisfaction through our end-to-end -end order process, whether it's the, the rating, kind of the problem reporting, the customer complaints. Um, we even link whatever is happening on the hotline to uh, uh, kind of real-time order. So we try to bring everything together to ultimately form an opinion uh, around whether this order was delivered or met the expectations or not. Uh, and customers can, like any kind of modern app at the moment, rate uh, every order. They can go in, provide feedback on the app. And all of this is being acknowledged and there's a dedicated uh, C-level who does nothing else other than basically analyze this data and, and, and draw conclusions. Amazing. I love that you guys are so data driven because I think a lot of companies sort of lose sight of these metrics and it's very kind of, I wouldn't say easy, but it's very transparent to see what's working and what's not working. So um, yeah, and I, I love that you are, you're analyzing these trends. So Kareem, I want to talk a little bit about the 
things that we don't necessarily hear about when it comes to starting a company. You know, as the show is called Startup Confessionals. Um, so I want to hear from you the things that really allow you to keep going, even in your difficult moments and in, in challenges. I think a lot of people talk about the success or the the sort of lighter side of starting companies, which is, um, you know, growing a team, having financial success, uh, having a, a, in a, being in a position of influence, but there's all these other things that I think a lot of people don't talk about. So I'd love to hear from you, you know, how did you, um, go through this process and deal with the challenges? Like what, what sort of things did you focus on or, or maybe it's frameworks or, or people in your life, but how did you just keep going and, and remain resilient? Well, of course, uh, look, there, there are, I would say hundreds of challenges when you're starting a company and, and kind of as a founder, you're being given every reason pretty much to kind of uh, call it a day and say, I'm not doing this <laughs> anymore. Uh, but um, it, 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 it really boils down to kind of the mentality and the resilience of the, of the founders. Uh, but more importantly, it's, uh, it's the team for me personally. So even if I'm having a, a, a tough day uh, at any given point or any stage of the company, just kind of walking through the company and seeing the different people and how kind of they've flourished there or someone who used to, I don't know, came fresh from university and now kind of is running a department or it's just the, the energy, to be honest, is what gets me going. Kind of just the positive energy of, of, of the team. And for me, this was the probably the most important factor in kind of uh, getting us through the, the, the hard times. Was there a mentor or a person in your family or personal life that was able to also help you through this process? Like how much of the journey is individual and solo and how much of it is community-based? Well, I wish I could tell you it's community-based, but <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, you're, look, it's... Um, you get you get people who help you along the way, would help you with advice, uh, help you sometimes see something you're not seeing. Uh, but a lot of the heavy lifting is at the end of the day individual is is I wouldn't call it individual because at the end of the day there are usually a number of founders who kind of carry the weight uh, together um, but um, I think it's um, let's say I, I, the way I justify it is probably that there's some form of uh, rite of passage in order to kind of get from that point to that point and usually the founders have to do it on their own and if they're lucky they meet someone who can help with the fundraising process, they might need someone who introduced them to, I don't know, great talent. You get lucky uh, along the way, but most of the heavy lifting you have to do on your own. Wow. Yeah, we've heard that uh, from other folks too, that it's re really is, it becomes a solo journey of, of you know, kind of digging <laughs> into the depths of your own being to be able to move forward. So that's powerful. And Kareem, what about the journey towards raising um, capital. Like, can you talk to us about what that was like for you and sort of, you know, for people that are interested in, in doing the same, like, what does that journey look like? Well, it's, uh, it's a notoriously difficult <laughs> journey. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, I, I, I came from kind of a corporate background, not knowing much about the startup or VC world. It just kind of came about that I was doing that. Um, everyone seems to be quite opinionated around what the best fundraising strategy is, how, how, how founders should do it, kind of how the deck should be structured and so on. Um, for me personally, I think it boiled down to kind of founders really believing in the idea. Um, kind of, uh, and and also do something that matters. Do kind of solve a problem that uh, uh, really matters. That really makes a difference. No, not a luxury. Not kind of a, an incremental improvement. Something that will transform the world around them. Uh, and then be to a large extent just genuine about their story. Uh, and and a big part of fundraising is. Uh, is, is having a good story, right? It's not about the slides. It's not about the business model. It's about uh, making people understand the impact and the gravity of uh, what is being done or, or kind of the, 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 the possibilities in the future. And I think possibly a lot of people kind of miss that angle and go directly into the more kind of 
technical discussion. Yes, that's such a powerful point. I want to double click on like being able to tell your story rather than going into what's the technical build of the product and how does it work and function. And I'm always so surprised whenever I read a company website, for example, and it feels like people are just talking about the features that they have instead of really becoming um, or or bringing us into a journey, um, which is um, something that I just think a lot of people struggle with. So I love that you pointed that out. And I just wanted to highlight that. <laughs> and, and in the case of the investors uh, who typically uh, get uh, 30 pitches a day with a uh, very short attention span, it's even uh, <laughs> more dramatic, I would, say. <laughs> I would say. So, yeah. Yes, that's yeah, so powerful. And Kareem, what sort of things have surprised you the most on this journey? Oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think a lot of things have surprised me. Uh, I, I don't think it's a single uh, it's a thing. I think... Um, it's it's important when you kind of come into the, the kind of the founder or startup world is just to accept to a large extent, even if you have, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years of experience, depending on your background, that uh, you don't actually know anything, right? And this is, um, it's, it's an important mental starting point. Um, and I think a lot of people come in with the prejudice that they, they have a specific experience or they have a certain expectation for the company as opposed to kind of um, uh, be kind of abstract and completely open to uh, kind of starting from scratch just mentally. Um, and I think this tends to surprise you if you're not kind of mentally conditioned for it, you will end up being surprised about uh, failures along the way you'll be surprised about um, how difficult it might be to actually build a, a good team you'll be also kind of it is then there's also a positive surprise when you see kind of a, a team that you've cultivated over the last I don't know X years kind of stand on their own and, and so I think it, it's full of surprises disappointments uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, emotional uh, uh, hard work that any founder has to go through so I can't tell you that it's a specific thing I think um, looking back now in retrospect, I would say I'm probably surprised on a weekly basis. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's so fun too. <laughs> and Kareem, what about in terms of how you keep yourself kind of um, motivated through resources or books? Like, is there a book that maybe you're reading now or that you read in the last like year or several, or several years that has impacted the way that you look at the world? Mm, I in one of the books, let's say more uh, not spiritual, but a bit. Uh, yes, I like uh, kind of the alchemist in general. Uh, I, I like the sense of the journey and just kind of uh, being able, kind of following the dream and, and going through a discovery and just sometimes realizing that it was staring you in the face. So I, I think there's a depth to it. I, I really enjoyed that book and uh, it, uh, it it guides a lot of the kind of. Uh, mental conditioning kind of approaching a new problem or kind of pursuing something more complicated yeah that's that's great i need to reread that book i read it so long ago but i remember how much it impacted me when i read it so <laughs> thanks for the reminder <laughs> what's maybe the most exciting thing about your product and roadmap in the years ahead um for me it's uh, it's the kind of network effects that are coming together uh, where um, more and more it's becoming more of a, um, the default uh, or we you know, is becoming kind of a default exchange network as opposed to kind of a, just a service platform where more and more kind of players and different types of players new kind of actors in the ecosystem start to connect to us as well to access uh, different types of data access new types of services. Uh, and this for me is very, very exciting because it means that we are constantly in kind of product development mode. We're constantly thinking of something new to, to, to offer kind of our, our ecosystem as opposed to a more monolithic kind of product approach. How do you find like inspiration for new ideas and for innovation? Like how do you know that you're on the right track and that you're constantly 
ahead of the curve in your industry or ecosystem? I don't think I can ever assume that I am. <laughs> so it's uh, <laughs> it's um, it's 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 actually probably uh, not the right mindset. But I think to, there are two aspects to 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 that. One is seeing the opportunities or the gaps, uh, and this really comes from um, talking to people and listening and and, and just kind of uh, trying to go beyond. Um, uh, beyond the problem that's being solved at the moment, noticing kind of the the, the kind of the problems that, that uh, the, the challenges that different actors in the ecosystem have. Um, so that's just um, really for, for me the best way to identify a problem is by interviewing people, is talking to people. I think for me this is kind of the the, the way that that gets me to. Uh, really see a problem that I believe we can possibly solve a year or a year and a half down the line. Um, the, the kind of from there on, kind of the, the the ideation process and kind of development process is has to remain kind of open minded, agile. We have to be okay that maybe it was the wrong idea that we try something that doesn't work. Um, but we are to a large extent very very fast to prototype stuff and very good to kind of uh, create meaningful kind of mini launch environments to test our products. So that's an important capability if you want to, if you want to kind of be in constant product development. Mm, yeah. Like being able to move fast. Yeah. Well, Kareem, this has been such a great conversation. I learned a lot from you and I'm just so excited to see the future of uh, Yodawi. And I will continue to watch uh, from the sidelines and cheer you on. So thank you so much for your time. Is there anything else that you want to tell our audience, any kind of main takeaway on motivation or maybe a call to action uh, for your company? I think I really enjoyed the conversation as well. Thank you, Asmin. I think I, I hope uh, kind of I can help or this helped other entrepreneurs or excited more people to kind of uh, go on this journey. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and hopefully we see a lot more companies in the, in the med tech and in short tech space. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Kareem. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening to Startup Confessionals.